Uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to our host for today. He is uh, David Nedowin. Uh, he is Chief Customer Officer and Co-Founder of Scope AR with over 20 years in digital transformation and advanced manufacturing and approximately 12 years with Scope AR as a co-founder. Uh, David, very excited to have you today. You're one of my favorite people at Scope AR. And so David, take it away, my friend. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, this is very exciting. I'm uh, terrifically, you know, just honored to be uh, hosting this today. We've got a wonderful panel. It's gonna be just some really great conversation. Um, you know, very much like a, like a fireside chat. We're gonna have some topics that we're gonna put out there discussion from uh, from our panelists who all have kind of different backgrounds, but obviously all in the aerospace industry. And it's just gonna, you know, gonna be something where we can share ideas, get different views on it, uh, you know, hopefully encourage some questions from the audience and uh, just, yeah, have a, have a really good uh, session here. So uh, first of all, some introductions. Um, uh, introduce Dan Anger, first systems engineer and augmented reality team lead at Lockheed Martin Space. So he's out of the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, I think Dan's been with Lockheed for about eight years and just really I, I've, you know, had the pleasure of working with Dan. Um, I think Lockheed was one of our very first customers starting back in 2015. So I've had a pleasure to work with Dan now for quite a few years. And he's just been critical in terms of like really starting with the initiatives of augmented reality and in, in, in like proof of concepts and moving into like manufacturing aids and default production. So he's really been there for the full journey. So um, awesome to have you here, Dan. And maybe just a real quick question. I'll do one question for like everybody off the start and then we'll get into a bit more conversation. Like really quickly in a minute or two, like why AR? Where did it start for you? Yeah, I guess to to kind of touch on that, for me personally, um, you know, the big thing with augmented reality is it really helps solve, you know, real world problems associated with difficult tasks that we deal with. You know, manufacturing very complex spacecraft, there's a lot of struggles and things that go into that, right? So, um, you know, with my background in assembly, manufacturing integration, I know exactly how difficult that can be on the floor. Um, and, you know, at Lockheed Martin Space specifically, um, a good portion of our products and vehicles are designed to carry out their mission in really complex environments, um, things that don't even stay on this planet for the most part. Um, for example, building the only deep space exploration class spacecraft, Orion, as you guys have well seen. Um, so these things are very difficult and they're complex to put together. And so using that and, and leveraging augmented reality to make that process better and to make our technicians and our engineers more knowledgeable and to understand in a deeper way what they're working on, that's really my big why with augmented reality and, and why we do it. And I personally love just seeing you know the, the faces light up when they see that next level of technology really come through. You know, and they get to understand things in a whole new layer they haven't seen before. So it really, that's that's my big why on uh, augmented reality and why I have such a passion for it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, Carl Hutter, president and CEO of ClickBond. I could probably take like the whole 30 minutes and just talk about Carl, but I'll try and keep it, uh, you know, fairly short here. So it's been with ClickBond for over 20 years. Uh, you know, taking on a number of roles, like right from the beginning, sales and leading business development and growing markets in Asia Pacific, and now the CEO and president. Um, Carl's been like uh, integral in terms of like growing the, the uh, or growing ClickBond as a global leader in the supply of bonded fasteners to all sorts of industries, obviously aerospace being primary, but also automotive and marine and industrial. And uh, aerospace, uh, aviation, very near and dear to his heart. He's also an accomplished pilot and sits on the board of many aviation uh, organizations. Um, Carl, same question to you. Uh, why AR? Where did it start for you? Yeah, so no, thanks so much, David. Um, so look, I've always been a, an, an aer aerospace guy first, grew up uh, in, in our family business that way. Um, but I was an electronic systems guy second and have found myself, uh, I don't wanna say trapped, but trapped in a nuts and bolts world for the last 23 years. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that we um, really are looking at transforming ClickBond from a uh, fastening systems company to an assembly technology company. And the benefit of our 35 year journey has, has been to teach us about a couple of really, really important fundamentals in aerospace that I think are super exciting. One, that the scale of aerospace is going to demand incredible talent, human beings doing complex things very, very well for a very long time to come. Even as we start bringing in automated tools, and technology to work alongside of us, the scale and the complexity of aerospace will always really require fantastic talent. So as we move into a new generation of learners, who absorb information differently, who learn differently, uh, who are being asked to do much more complex things. 
what can we do to bring incredible technology to, as uh, my friend Nick Pinchuk at Snap-on calls them, uh, the makers and the fixers of the world. So whether you're building uh, spacecraft and aircraft, or whether you're repairing them um, you know, on the forward operating base or in the uh, airline hangar, what can we do to enable um, incredible people to do even more by bringing the tools to, uh, to them to teach them and to uh, enable them while they carry out that work? And I think AR is the key to that. I'm so excited to be making that part of, part of our mission as well. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Carl. Um, and uh, Michael Hinckley. So Michael Hinckley, Senior Manager of Programs in Palmdale. He's been with uh, Northrop Grumman for over 15 years and, and ultimately responsible for all programs in Palmdale. You can imagine there's quite a few of those like F-35, Hale B-2, and I'm sure there's probably a lot more that I don't know about and Michael's probably not going to share with us. Um, but yeah, uh, really, really key in the acceleration and and the the use of technology to help with efficiency and what they're doing with the manufacturing and design side. So, um, Michael, as quickly, same question to you: Why AR? Where did that start for you? Yeah, so I, I appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, really carrying on the torch for the team, starting back uh, 2017, 2018. It really started as a pilot, um, but I mean, the crux of a augmented reality for our company is obviously you know first time quality cost and schedule are paramount on very complex systems. You guys had it in your opener, right? It's instant expert, right? Whether you're a technician out on the floor, you're a quality inspector, uh, is data at the ready. Uh, and I think something that our customer is starting to demand is speed. Uh, we're not manufacturing at the speed that we need to on these complex systems. And augmented reality brings you the benefits um, in real time uh, and, and includes data integrity, right? as we take some of that information, uh, display it down for the people that are using it, and then take that information and ultimately put it back into our manufacturing systems, which I think is incredibly important through um, the technology development phases of programs all the way out through sustainment. So that's the true power of AR. Um, it is just like the cell phone that you have in your pocket. It's not really a cell phone. It's a computer with a bunch of advanced sensors and, and radios. Uh, it is your instant expert that can do uh, many amazing things for your people uh, and really get the products at the speeds that we need um, delivered down the line to our end customer. Yeah, fantastic. And, and yeah, completely agree. I mean, it's it's incredible how much has changed over the last number of years that right now in the palm of our hands or going forward, the, the hardware devices we use really are going to be the ones that help us become instant experts. So I'm going to, you know, this is meant to be something that we're going to want to share your experiences as leaders and innovators in, in uh, leveraging technology. And of course, not just AR and XR, but all the different technologies that you implement to help improve the efficiencies. And we're going to want to share some of those ideas and topics through conversation with obviously the audience. And so I'm going to put some topics out there. Hopefully there, there are things that you feel um, passionate about and you've got some ideas on and love to hear how you approach those from different perspectives. So, I mean, maybe, uh, Michael, even looking at timing of all of this, uh, it's, it's interesting because from my perspective, as someone who's in the technology space, uh, you know, it feels like we've been working in this industry for the last eight or 10 years. So in some cases, it feels like we move at a snail's pace of getting things going, right? Of getting to the point of actually putting things in production. But when I look at it more from the perspective of the aerospace industry, who, I mean, truly is leaders and innovators in, in leveraging technology uh, in a lot of different areas. And, and that's just, I mean, that's why we love working with aerospace. There's other industries, of course, that are slower to adopt technology and some of those being, you know, that we, that, that we know, I mean, there's leaders and there's laggards. Um, it, it feels like it's probably, you know, at light speed. So I'm curious, uh, you know, how do you view the progress and scale of, of leveraging XR technologies to this point? And where do you kind of see us maybe on that hockey stick sort of curve, if you imagine that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a good question. I think adoption at all levels from your CEO down through your uh, your worker out on the factory floor is paramount. Security is paramount for our, our companies with the work that we do. Uh, and so the integration of these products and technologies, both on the hardware and software side, uh, is, um, is difficult. And so it does feel like snail's pace uh, sometimes, but there's a lot of big wins there. Uh, where we can uh, get these technologies out uh, on the manufacturing spaces in the hands of the people that need them. And we've done a really good job at doing that. And that's really through a large team uh, of stakeholders, uh, whether it's systems engineers, your cyber, your IT um, uh, folks, 
the people actually using the technologies, the training, um, and you know all the complementary systems that go into the deployment uh, to pull together. But once you have that team to go do those difficult things, it becomes much easier. So understanding uh, who your true uh, stakeholders are for the technologies, and then all the people that are going to go help implement will certainly help speed uh, things up. And then working with your industry partners. Uh, whether it's a Scope AR or Microsoft or a HoloLens 2, is also paramount to make sure we're shaping the products in a way that they can be used to open up apertures for more business cases, and that will also help with speed of adoption. Yeah, for sure. I know you yeah. focus specifically on that team aspect. I mean, every time we talk, it's about you know putting that right team together that has like the same vision and being able to leverage those those visions to accelerate something. Carl, I mean, you see it from different perspectives, right? You see a bunch of different types of of organizations that probably have been on different stages of that journey. Like where, where do you see it? I mean, like love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. So, so of course what we're doing is, is really keenly looking at exactly what Michael and Dan's you know, needs are um, and really trying to, to probe, to find out what are the key challenges that they, through their, you know, a decade of internal work and really, really putting, you know, special teams on this, uh, you know, have identified as being, you know, the, the killer apps. Um, you know, I'll tell you that I actually, you know, working with customers that range from sort of the incumbents um, that, are, that are with us today who have been at this a long while to some of the newest startups in the AAM space and, and elsewhere. One of the things around this technology and this subject that excites me the most is that I don't really see a difference in the enthusiasm to move like briskly uh, to make this stuff happen. And I think that, you know, we are in an industry uh, that may, you know, it's complimentary to hear you say, David, that we, we feel like we're moving fast, uh, you know, as, as a consumer of your technology, this is good because aerospace defense tends to be slow to change. Um, it appears bleeding edge, but it's of course actually a very conservative industry usually. Uh, but I'm really excited by seeing this universal enthusiasm to go. And what that means to me is that the value is really there. And I think that as we all face the workforce challenges um, that are upon us as we see the recovery post COVID, as we see the emergence of whole new mobility technologies and, 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 and ecosystems like AAM, um, and as we prepare ourselves for an increasingly kind of concerning geopolitical space and, and what that could mean, uh, I think that all of this technology and the and the productivity it enables and the readiness it enables is arriving kind of just on time. So, um, you know, I, I guess I just say, you know, we're we're there as a, a, a key listener to see what the uh, big emerging challenges are for um, ROEM customers and really being ready to respond, not just with um, answers to those questions, but taking that info to say, hmm, maybe something like this. Uh, so, yeah. Um, really, really kind of focus on, I think, the use cases first, the challenges for adoption of any new technology in a high security space is well understood. Um, but I think we have to, I guess I just also say this, I think we also recognize that, you know, today's um, wearables uh, aren't the most um, ergonomic or, you know, awesome uh, things that, that you know, we could possibly imagine, but they're a great way to kind of whet the appetite and to get started. I think we have to treat that piece, the hardware technology, much like you would need to think about today's internet when you were conceiving use cases in the late 90s, right? You have to have faith in that case that one day there's gonna be this big fat pipe that can pipe anything you want, not only into your home or office, but into your pocket. And I think it's the same thing here. Uh, we should not be limited in our imagination by what today's hardware or what today's, I guess, organizational paradigms might constrain us to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I like two two kind of major topics out of there, like use cases, obviously is paramount. And I think everybody's trying to figure out where is the right use case to start with, but also like what is the killer use case going forward? I mean, Dan, you you talked about some of the importance of the use cases that you have, and I think one of the reasons why aerospace industry actually is relatively quick is it's this really big, expensive, high value problems. Some of the other industries that have lower value problems might take a little bit more time to your point, like maybe hardware is not quite where you want it to be yet. So they're going to wait a little bit longer, let you guys kind of blaze a trail and decide exactly how to, you know, or when to jump onto that bandwagon. Um, you know, uh, Dan, use cases. I mean, you talked about those. What do you see as like maybe the ones that had 
the highest value, most immediate impact, right? And maybe even it ties into the hardware side to it. I mean, I know at, at Lockheed, you know, the HoloLens is a device that you're using, um, you know, in, in a lot of different use cases, but, you know, maybe at some other, uh, I mean, Michael, you can talk about some of the hardware devices you're using and how does that impact those use cases? So a, a lot there to unpack, but yeah, I'd love you guys just to like share some of these ideas. Dan, any, any thoughts around that? Yeah, definitely. For for Lockheed specifically, you know, the use cases has been a major one for us to start off with, um, and and it it does it's a it's a specific challenge, like you said, particularly with space equipment. You know, we're looking at at high mix, low volume environments where you know we're building one off custom satellites, maybe sometimes some constellations, um, sets of vehicles, but almost every time it's it's doing it right the first time and you really have to get the value out the first time you use it you know we're not sitting on a on a manufacturing assembly line where we're going to kick out you know a thousand of these things over the next year um you know sometimes we get some higher production volumes but for the mars for the most part our volumes are real low and so that that unique problem really affects our use cases and how we get value out of augmented reality in general and so to kind of answer the direct question you had with, um, you know, what do we start with? And so one of the things we looked at early on, and, and this has been, you know, talked about in previous sessions too, is um, starting with something simple like position alignment, where we're just able to see a, a photorealistic CAD model overlaid in holographic form over the top of real world hardware. You know, you're just getting a much more content rich environment. You're able to see, you know, and, and actually place those items much more quickly. And you see a really high, you know, value coming out of that because the scenarios and the technology are real easy to use for that. There's not a lot of time and effort that goes into building that. So it's an easy one for our program teams to pick up and use. And then you get the, the value out the back end with the technicians on the shop floor and our operations folks um, really seeing that and getting early adoption. And so they they start there. And then I think it's so critical to, to start with a very simple use case, prove value early, and then slowly let it organically mature into extra use cases and pick up more value as you go. You know, you could, you could brainstorm a million ideas in the world and come up with a thousand different use cases um, where we could say AR could help us in various, you know, areas of the business. But I think it's so critical to start and keep it simple, prove value early, and then let it grow from there. And so do you, do you start with the use case and then figure out, you know, sort of is the hardware at the place that you want to be? I mean, Carl, you brought up the hardware. I mean, Michael, feel free to jump in. Or do you say, hey, here's where the technology is at today and then align it to a problem that you've identified? How, how do you go about that approach? It's a little bit of both. We definitely try and keep a good pulse across the industry with hardware limitations and what we can do. And, you know, even looking at like, you know, some of the, the technological challenges that Microsoft had in actually manufacturing and creating the HoloLens 2 to do what it does, um, that, that even speaks volumes to how fast all of this is innovating and developing. Um, so, you know, as, as the as new hardware and software becoming available um, and those are maturing, it obviously quickly advances what you're able to do and tracking those, those things over time um, helps you deploy and, and mature into new and better use cases. Um, so it is kind of a trade-off, but we start with a good, good industry knowledge of hardware limitations and capabilities, and then we kind of do the, the cast the net out there for which problems we can solve. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say that there's also, I think, in the technology roadmap for this whole industry, there are questions that are constantly coming up as we get experience with these in these use cases of saying, what sort of capability needs to reside where? So what do you do in, say, the head-mounted display versus what do you do on some back-end system and then just pipe imagery? Where does image recognition need to happen? Where does uh, alignment and location need to happen? And to what level of accuracy in different cases? So, I mean, there's, there's a whole swirl here that kind of the vocabulary is developing as we all get a little more knowledgeable about what we need in different places. Like for example, if, you're, if you don't need to use your hands, you don't need a head mounted display, uh, there, it's amazing how capable it can be, you know, looking through the magic window, say of a tablet, if what you're looking to do is inspect uh, and, and, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, I'll push on a, a bit too, David, real quick. Um, yeah. You certainly limit yourself uh, on capability. Obviously, there's hardware uh, technology limits, but you can push on those a bit. So working with uh, your suppliers and your partners on both the hardware and software side is paramount. 
Uh, Carl said a lot of interesting things. I, from an adoption standpoint, don't play a video to uh, kind of wow the crowd with augmented reality. Get the headset on them and let them start to come up with their own and ideas and form their own opinions of what the technology can do. Look at where we were with computers um, decades ago. It was AOL and Oregon Trail, uh, and now we have some of the most <laughs> advanced computer systems in the world, right, where eventually uh, augmented reality will take us to a place like Carl had mentioned, some of the edge computing, where you do things in, with your sensors and cameras, to a place where the end user devices will be the inspector, and you will no longer need a quality uh, person out there doing that inspection. So. Uh, don't give up on the technology because it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode uh, and it's going to happen quick. Uh, push on it where you can to open up the aperture for the amount of use cases you can tackle. But certainly there's a limit on things you do and keep those, those list of um, use cases that you want to tackle that you can't today in your backlog uh, ready for tomorrow. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. Michael, like in my view, I think that there was a lot of hype around hardware devices five, six, eight years ago that didn't necessarily come to like meet the expectations that was set by it, right? And so then hardware devices, like obviously some didn't quite make it, a lot of disappeared, HoloLens kind of emerged as sort of a leader. We're seeing some other ones that that now are coming out, uh, Magic Leap 2 and Lenovo and several others that we're seeing, um, probably expect something from Apple at some point. Do, do you think the hype around that and maybe not quite meeting those expectations helped the conversations when you're talking to leadership or you're trying to get support and traction or, you know, maybe hinder that where it's like, oh, yeah, well, this is kind of like a fad. And obviously that didn't necessarily, you know, accelerate the way we thought it would. So, you know, you're going to have to prove it to me more. Did, what do you think? Did that help or hinder? Well, I think it helps. But I certainly don't think our leadership thinks that what we're doing in the XR space is a fad. Uh, any longer because we've demonstrated results, right? Uh, and that's what's been extremely important across the company. So, you know, I think Daniel also touched on and, and, and Carl also, you know, adoption needs to be across your entire enterprise. So when you can help people be fast followers on technology, uh, adoption scales, and I think industry leaders on the hardware and software side will note that uh, we're buying more devices, we're buying more licenses, uh, and they're going to put a little bit more investment into getting to the state that we really need to. I think people know that I've, I've commented on the hardware side. You know, it's, we're kind of like at the T-Mobile sidekick uh, phase, I think, on the hardware. Uh, we're not at the Apple iPhone uh, Pro Max, you know, 13 uh, technology um, that we should be as far as end user devices are concerned, especially in the augmented reality space. But we're getting there. And if we can keep working with our industry partners, we're going to get there much faster. Yeah, so proving value to get the support you need through showing ROI is like, let's get to this point, prove some value, demonstrate that, and then get the support you need to expand beyond that. Is that, that's basically the approach that you've had. Yes. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Carl, like from your perspective, I mean, uh, this kind of gets into the next like thoughts of like you were talking about change management, right? And getting people to understand exactly where this is gonna have an impact on the organization. And you see that both from like an internal perspective and then also external from, from customers. What's, you know, I guess what's the, the biggest tips or advice you've had in terms of, or might have in terms of somebody who's looking at it and going, how do we approach change management with uh, both internal, getting leadership to buy in, getting end users to go, yeah, this is something I actually really want to do. Maybe I'm comfortable doing it this way already, but, you know, I'm going to look at uh, a technology like XR because how do, how do you approach that? Or how do you sure. see that that's successful? So internally, it's simple because of my title. I, I, I don't need to convince leadership, but uh, I need to convince uh, Daniel and Mike, uh, but I think they're on board. Look, I, I think that the question is the really important one. And for all of us, it's, is this seen as a threat or is this seen as a force multiplier and an amazing tool by the people who are going to be using it, which is all of our frontline folks. And I've got this wonderful position where even as we continue to develop uh, XR as a product and a service and find what our, you know, what our space is going to be in our industry with regard to that. I have this living laboratory, which is our own ClickBond factory and our own, you know, 500 ClickBonds. And uh, I had a really incredible privilege to actually roll out uh, with, with our team um, at, our, at our last all hands meeting just two weeks ago, which we've done in a sort of science format, uh, the same exhibits we brought to Farnborough this summer. So we took our pieces of T38, which is uh, 
uh, for the Northrop crowd, uh, I'm sure uh, appreciated. T38F5 is our living laboratory for, for our XR experiments. And uh, we really just, you know, we put hollow lenses and gave tablets to our folks um, in the context of, of a wider theme, which is bringing in automation, bringing in data tools, bringing these things into our own shop floors. And the message that we genuinely want to send and, and we mean, which is do not fear this technology. It's not here to take your job. It's here to raise the value of the work that we're all capable of doing. And that raising tide is going to, you know, rising tide is going to you know, raise all of our boats. So it was really amazing to see, David, the response, um, as I think Michael said, you know, when you actually put the headset on them, you know, don't try to show them a video um, and, and, and they light up. And even your most curmudgeonly, you know, Connecticut tool maker who's, you know, been working at a carbide grinder, you know, just deploying his art or her art, you know, will say, oh, wow, this is, this is, this is something totally different. So what I, what I just kind of throw in here into the conversation is really, you know, we can talk about back-end technology, we can talk about endpoint technology, um, you know, but you're right, the change management piece is, uh, is really the key. How do you get the people who are going to use this and benefit from this to do more productive work and to have more capability on our shop floors and our field support, how do we get them part of the creative process by going, oh, wow, hold on, that's cool, but could it also do X? Because the tip of the spear, you know, is really where uh, the ideas, I think, best come from here. So get that, get that team out there at the, at the, you know, local level engaged. Not only does that help with the change management problem, but it actually gets you the best solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting it out to the workers and seeing what types of uh, problems that they can solve with it and what they can imagine. And, and it's, it's, it's super interesting. I mean, you sit in a room or you put it in front like the HoloLens on eight different workers and you're going to have 16 different ideas of what you can do, right? And then it's just a matter of trying to figure out which ones make the most sense based on value and use case and everything else. So, I mean, Dan, your, your organization's interesting just because obviously in space, you've got some specific problems that you're solving, which is very different than RMS and very different than Aero. Like from that side of it, what does that look like in terms of socializing, getting people to understand and find those use cases both internally and is that being shared externally? Or is it like kind of that one cohesive approach now that that people are starting to look at from even outside of space and saying like, how do we do this? Like, what are the use cases? How do we uh, get end users and leadership to buy into that? Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot of a lot of things that go into, you know, user buy in and, and how you drive that adoption and, and how you target it. Like you said, we are in space and we deal with different problems than than even our other internal business areas might. Um, it, it's a difficult thing for sure to, to get your arms around. But I think one thing is the strategy is key. So we really do look at, you know, what are we going to do and how we have targeted use cases and really getting the folks to understand and to see the value. That's kind of what I was poking at earlier when it comes down to an early adopter with use cases is, you know, I, as Carl was saying, you know, you could, you could have someone that's very much, you know, depth in their art and they just focus on doing their one thing. Well, you put this headset on and I would say 99% of people out there, almost every single person I put the headset on, they, they look at and go, oh, wow, this is crazy. Um, you know, I've, I've heard comments like this is why I, I work at Lockheed Martin. I feel like I'm working in the future, you know, so it, it's generally pretty easy to get users to see the value and to get that, you know, socialized through the various organizations. But obviously there's, you know, with a big organization like Lockheed Martin, it's a big company. There's a lot of people and, you know, not everyone always has the same outlook and perspective. And so I would also say from a user buy-in perspective, um, you know, you'll occasionally run across the ever so rare person that, you know, is, is very resistant to technology in general. You know, it might be the guy driving a, a 1970 car that refused to, you know, have fuel injection or whatever it might be. Um, and, the, and they're afraid of technology. So I find one of the best ways that we deal with the user buy-in and, and handling that is um, actually getting their, getting their opinion early and having them help solve the problem and clear the hurdles themselves. And then they start to actually develop a sense of ownership with the solution that they're providing. And they seem, they, they usually flip quite quickly and actually turn into one of the bigger advocates you might have in adopting the technology. So it's kind of that, it's very complex uh, trade-off with, with user buy-in and, and uh, deployment, but it, it's a good one. Yeah, that, that love that, you know, get them involved early. 
make them an ad advocate, have them show, oh, well, if this person can do this and show value to it, we certainly can as well. And, and uh, have them, uh, you know, have some ownership to it. I think that's great. Um, yeah, fantastic. And, and you also touched on a little bit of like an interesting topic, um, the skills gap too, right? Uh, wanting, everybody wants to attract the best employees. And I think right now everybody's going through, you know, all organizations, whether it's, you know, a small company like Scope AR or some of the largest companies like we have here, I think everyone's going through that same challenge of uh, retaining and attracting great employees. I mean, it's just, just reality of, I don't think anyone's, um, anyone's not encountering that. So skills gap is something that I think as we go forward is going to be more important to more and more important to address in terms of like the good employees, the good workers are going to want to have technology they're going to engage with. They're going to want to know that our organizations are leveraging technology that's going to help them do their job more efficiently, um, make less mistakes. And so attracting those employees will be great for companies that have, have uh, engaged in that early, right? Um, I don't know if that's something that that anybody on the panel is seeing or, uh, you know, has, yeah, has I had that. David, I, I'd even go, I'd even go one step for one step further with your with your good comment there. Um, not just you know feeling like they're enabled and backstopped by technology to make fewer mistakes, but how about this one, making better decisions? Meaning what? Okay, so this is something we're really trying to do in our deployment of tools and technology at ClickBond. I really want, and I don't think that that thinking should be the purview of of someone at a certain altitude in the organization. I want everybody to be able to apply their mind to what they're doing. And the only way you can really do that is by structuring work in a way that gives everybody the data they need, the information they need in a job description that lets them actually be more autonomous. Not when I come up against something that looks like a turn back, I wait until someone comes to review this, but how can I keep moving and know at the backside of that decision that you know I kept moving based on a choice I made and felt confident and, and authorized to make. I think that this is really one of the great uh, possibilities of XR in manufacturing. And it's, I, I just like to kind of say, we talked a lot of times about work instructions or training uh, or these things, but I really just try to generalize it and say, making the unseen seen. So as we can start bringing in other sources of data off of PLM systems, other systems of record, off of tools that you may hold in your hand or sensors that you know, may be uh, you know, relevant to the work. How can we pull data together in a very broad sense, present it to the technician and enable them at their point of use to make better decisions and be more engaged in their work? When we start looking at that, right, I think it has this very profound impact on the satisfaction of the job that people are able to do. Yeah, you've you've actually so you've just started to uncover a really interesting topic here, right? So I'm going to throw a word out there to I guess it's two words, a term, and I'd love to get anybody's thoughts on this, like digital thread, right? I mean, it's a, it's a term that's been used for a while. I think in some cases it it's exciting, but I think in some cases it's also scary a little bit because not any, like everybody can interpret it slightly differently. Like it's it's taking, you know, terms like industry 4.0 and digital transformation and factory of the future and looking at, to your point, the data that's available from IoT and real-time connected workers and connected tools and cloud computing and artificial intelligence and, and making all of this available to a worker so that they can actually then, you know, have the, have the right information to perform the task. And then AR shows somebody how to do that task. So it's not something that you should be afraid of. No one owns this term. It's a strategy. It's about looking at the technology architecture and saying, what does this mean to our organization? How does this information all connect together? And what does it look like for the worker going forward? So digital thread, you know, just thoughts, uh, conversation, any, any ideas around that and what it means to you and what it's, what are we going to be talking about two years from now when we have the same panel together type thing? I have a couple comments there, David. So one back to what Carl said, you know, making the unseen scene, the information should be available to the CEO and everyone uh, down and up the chain, right? Uh, whether you're working in facilities and you're using augmented reality to look through a wall at your structure or you're, you need information to quickly make decisions on how to get to your first meeting in the day. I mean, how many people have walked around large companies like ours just trying to find the badging office at a new facility, just trying to get to a conference room? Uh, very frustrating, right? The work we do is difficult. 
and then you you throw things like that uh, on top of your everyday stress and it makes it uh, even more difficult. So uh, information is powerful and if we can visualize that information uh, coming from you know sources, multiple sources within uh, your companies, uh, that that's powerful. On the digital threat side, uh, I would say that we we really focus this conversation around end user devices. And what I, what I would call kind of like down the line, right? The software and hardware that's ultimately going to be deployed. But what about all of the information that pours into those systems to make informed decisions, and then that information being taken back up to maintain that digital thread? I think in in cases like uh, Daniel's situation, where it's not arrow, right? Um, you really have to evaluate whether these technologies really provide the business value that you're looking for. And if you can actually create content from your PLMs and NES systems um, to those devices, then you solve some of that equation. So I, I think that the biggest muscle movement comes from data up front and what you do with that and data, how you ingest it and parse it out and decom decompose it uh, down, and then how you take that back information back up to complete that digital thread. Yeah, and I would just say to add to that too, like just like Michael was saying, you know, it, it is a, a challenge to get through and pull that digital thread. And like he was saying, with spacecraft equipment, um, you know, you do have to leverage a very good upfront design. You are going to only build this thing once or twice, for example. Um, and so it also underpins this overall thought of design for manufacturing. So, and, and it's very interesting to see how augmented reality overlays on top of that topic. Because previously, and you know, years ago, engineering and design was thought to be a very siloed thing where you basically design something, you may never see it again, you're not talking to manufacturing folks. And that's in reality, that's not the world we're living in anymore. You know, we're, we're actually able to, to design for manufacturing, get the end user's opinion, get the smart technicians involved in the upfront design process so it works better down the line. And you know, in, injecting augmented reality into that scenario really takes it to a whole new level where you're visualizing the design data, like Michael said, from the PDM systems, from our CAD repositories, and you're visualizing that directly on the as-built hardware. So you're doing a direct as-design, as-built comparison anytime you put on a headset with a CAD model in it. So it really changes that whole paradigm of how technicians and engineers can view our information on the floor. And it's, it's visualizing in a different way, you know, instead of looking at a screen or a drawing, you're seeing it right on top of the hardware and people's brains are, are just generally uh, difference engines. They pick up on things that stick out. So when you're looking at a 3D hologram over the top of the real world hardware, you pick up on things that don't match very quickly. So it, it just underpins that overall idea of a, of a fundamental change in design for manufacturing. Dan, I've got a question for you on that sense, because you are in this special space that so you remind us, you know, you may only do this once <laughs> or twice, and, and there's no service call, <laughs> at least yeah. with a lot of the things you do. Um, I'm curious, do you see value then sort of as an adjunct to what, what you were just saying in using XR technology in the design phase? So maybe at the engineering kind of CAD scope level, uh, um, you know, maybe some constraints are set up, but then maybe you load this into an interactive AR or VR world where then people can try to literally manipulate the parts and build it within the constraints and find at even the design phase where the uh O's are going to be or where the betters could be. I mean, is that something that you've looked at? Because I think there's a lot of power given that, you know, you may be doing this once or twice. Yeah, we definitely do do that for sure. And there's different technology stacks you can use for that as well. Um, you know, I've seen some like human factors assessment, you know, heritage systems, maybe, you know, something analogous to a gaming engine where you have, you know, a, a an avatar of a person that's, you know, some 50th percentile person that can walk around the digital version. Um, you can also do similar things like that with VR as well. I mean, if you're not in, in a real world environment, you can turn off the camera and have a completely simulated environment, do human factors and manufacturability assessments in virtual reality as well. But it's interesting that you can do that same thing also with augmented reality. And really, it also comes down to the benefit that you get with augmented reality in that in that you know, design assessment phase is you can you can do things like factory simulation and overlay real world scenarios in holographic form into a real world high bay um, or, or a real world structure. You can overlay those things on top of it. So it's that interaction between physical and digital that really makes AR be more beneficial for the design phase like that. 
Um, but for simple things like, hey, can I stick a wrench here to turn this bolt? Can a technician reach their arm in and access this panel when they're assembling something? Those things are definitely considerations and we see value out of that um, with AR, VR technologies. But it's definitely interesting to look at the, the, the minute differences between AR and VR and how those can benefit that. Yeah, great, great stuff. Hey, one, so I guess as we kind of wrap up here, I want to ask each of you one question. Uh, it's just, you know, if you were starting now, uh, what would you recommend to somebody who's about to engage on this journey, about to start this journey? What would be the one recommendation uh, that you would have for them? Uh, Dan, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah, I would definitely say um, it's it's a quickly changing space and it's hard to get involved and jump in. But I think the most critical thing I could say to someone getting started that hasn't you know, done full campaigns with this type of technology before is adopt early and just keep it simple to begin with. I've seen so many people that really honestly get excited about this technology. Most people, most engineers and organizations like ours will get very excited about the technology and they love putting on their science hat and, and, and really you know, brainstorming ideas. And that can sometimes get you a runaway a little bit. So the biggest thing is really keep it super simple. Look at a problem, target it, get it solved, and then let it organically grow. I think that would be the one piece of advice I would probably give to someone. Yeah, it doesn't need to solve every problem you have. It needs to solve one problem. Right? To start, to start off with, yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Uh, Michael, how about yourself? What would be one piece of advice you would give someone who's starting on this journey? Uh, building blocks, you know, a lot of what, what Dan said, um, having those in place, people will get really excited about the technology and want to run real fast. Um, and then the technologies that you advertise, if they don't behave and function in the way that you, you advertise those, um, <laughs> that, that goes downhill real quick. Um, so making sure that you validated uh, the work that you've done and it, and it, and it behaves as prescribed um, will, will get you a long way. And then making sure you get those on both your internal and external customers, uh, show them the value of those products will uh, certainly help uh, your case and help those that are that are fast following the technologies. Yeah, for sure. When you say building blocks, what can you can you talk a little? What do you mean by building blocks exactly? So the systems approach, like Daniel said, you know, there's a lot of people who want to grab a Hololens and and run off, but we all know that's not how it works, right? So understanding, um, doing your trades on the technology, both on the hardware side. Um, doing your business case analysis is extremely important. Keep it simple. Uh, like you said, uh, get started, and then you can evolve the, the technology as it goes. And I would say the building blocks are helpful for those that are fast following. If you have those in place, make sure you share those with your teams so they can get spun up real quick and, and kind of move in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, fast pace. Yeah, so a repeatable playbook that you can say, follow these steps, and this is how we get to you to a point of value. So. I would kind of combine both of those two comments as, as a guy who is just getting started in this, but in doing this uh, in a world where people are at different phases of their journey, the folks we're trying to help. And so I'm looking very carefully and asking, where do I find you, Lockheed Martin? Where do I find you, Northrop Grumman? What, what are already givens and what is white space? Okay, and recognizing that that, that will shift over time. But understanding what anything we bring to the party needs to talk to and talk to in a certain way and interface with um, as kind of the lay of the land. And so this kind of ties to that, that building blocks or modularity that Michael uh, mentioned. I kind of would cast this a different way um, based on the same fundamental. Um, there are so many things that we will be able to do with this technology. Um, we've touched on a lot of them here today two-directional information, systems of record, IoT-enabled tools and sensors, and then, of course, you know, just the, the basic AR present data to the human case. Um, none of them, if we try to set up a scenario where we have to have all of it and all of the answers figured out before we can have any of it, then none of this happens. And it certainly doesn't happen as fast as it could, and we leave a lot of value on the table for a long time. Breaking all of this down into what the digestible chunks are, whether it's because of what's possible security-wise right now, ergonomically right now, use case right now, and, and, and try to understand how that tool set, that set of building blocks or Legos can be put together in different ways by different users over, different, over time. 
and make it modular and think ahead towards a, an architecture and a structure. And as, of course, as all of us together, develop some standards around what we mean when we say this and how that and that talk to each other. And, uh, and again, don't try to, don't set up some precious thing that requires everything to happen at once. Um, let this be layer on layer. Let this be chunk by chunk and, uh, and, and, and adaptable to what's needed and what's possible at any given time. Yeah, thank you. That, and that's why you guys are leading the space in terms of innovators and, you know, um, people within your organizations that are that are taking that systematic approach. I mean, it, it shows in terms of the success that you're having and the growth that you're having. So awesome, uh, awesome stuff. Um, I think that's a great jumping off point uh, to get into a few questions that I that I think have been uh, posed. I think there's some great questions for our panelists. So, Robert, is is that something that you want to share now? Yeah, absolutely. So, um I'll, I'll just go back in the, the Q and A panel. Uh, and then thank you guys someone so much for your questions. We got I think more than we have time for, but uh, we'll do our best to get these uh, sorted and uh, addressed. Even if your question isn't answered uh, by a panelist. But diving right in, Olivier Trudeau says, uh, outside of the more internal use cases, I'm interested to understand your view of AR and VR in supporting outreach and marketing objectives. Is that something that uh, that you guys see in your industry? Yeah, I would say I can jump in on that one. I, I would definitely say, um, you know, with with the capabilities to show, you know, CAD level designs in 3D space, it definitely has some marketing, uh, you know, and, and outreach use cases. And we have done that on several occasions. You know, we've, we've definitely demonstrated some early on designs and use that to help, um, you know, demonstrate our our successes and ability to manufacture for these programs um, and potential customers. So definitely, you uh, um, there, there's definitely use cases there and we're, and we're looking at it and maturing it as we go. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, jumping right ahead to the next question. This one's from Felix. Um, I'll sort of zip to the real punch of the question. And he says, how do I convince management on the ROI, presumably of, of AR? Um, this is something I think everyone here has, has faced at one point. Uh, anyone wanna share how, how they approached it? Well, since it was mentioned in small and medium-sized companies, maybe I'll, I'll take a step. Um, work, work, workforce. Think about think about your recruiters and your hiring department, your people ops people right now. Think about what you're trying to achieve, hopefully in a growth plan over the next few years. I assume and imagine that the number one constraint you're going to face is where am I going to get people that can do X, Y, or Z? Uh, how will I get enough of them and how will I get them to stay? And so one of those big pieces is how do I get people capable of doing more different things that are higher value added and more complex? I think this is an area that's just really rich as an ROI case, whether it's again in the facilities scenario, allowing someone to gaze across the plant floor and see the status and needs of a, of a row of, of CNCs, or whether it's somebody learning uh, a new assembly technique for a complex assembly or how to uh, how to do a field service uh, you know, operation and work on more different uh, customer use cases. I think this is a, a very rich and fertile ground that specifically ties to talent. Um, and so here we have technology returning value on probably the most challenging business thing that we're facing today. Yeah, uh, great great answer, Carl. Um, from the same question uh, attendee. He asks, uh, anyone suffer uh, fatigue and uh, user wear, or wear fatigue rather, uh, from wearing the headsets themselves, especially for eight hour shifts? Uh, and how do you address the safety and ergonomic factors of that? Yeah, I would definitely say from the, the Lockheed Martin side of the house, um, there's, there's definitely a lot of things that go into that. You know, you have ESH assessments, you have all kinds of environmental compliance and, and human factors assessments that go into that. Um, we definitely assess and, and put out standards on those things. Um, we also work with our industry partners, such as Microsoft with the HoloLens too, um, to really understand the impacts of users. And we do assessments with that. Um, honestly, we've had really good success with the HoloLens too and other lightweight devices like that. Um, it's a real balanced, neutral headset. And um, there's also pretty standard guidance out there that we've developed internally um, for ESH guidance on how you handle this. You know, if you have vision issues, what you can do with that. But overall, the uh, widespread experiences, um, it's really not that much different than looking at a computer screen, which we all do every day. 
So, I mean, you're looking near, near field, close to a screen, you're interacting with things, but it's also adjusting your vision. So it's not the same as a fixed focal length. It actually can be easier on the eyes than working with a computer. So there's definitely um, some trade-offs and factors to it, and that's something we track for sure. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, another great question here. Uh, I think he, Mr. Aaron Voigt is kicking off a subject for a whole nother webinar. Uh, he says, being with the defense and aerospace industries, uh, there's a large emphasis on data security and compliance. How have the panelists navigated the realm of ITAR export compliance, CUI, EAR 99 reg, and regulation uh, in relation to their use of working products and outputs? I mean, that's it's a whole other webinar, but anyone want to touch on that briefly? How about the black, how about the black arts guy? <laughs> <laughs> on that a bit, Carl. Obviously, compliance is important, uh, whether you're uh, in an unclassified space or a restricted area. Uh, so we work closely with our IT and cybersecurity departments from day one uh, when we put these uh, these products in place. Uh, that's the key. Is the uh, is the team is all there day one. You're not bringing them in, you know, three quarters of the way down the road, only to find out that uh, what you constructed isn't going to make it uh, over the fence. I don't want to go into too much detail on that one, um, but uh, that, I think that's been a lot of our success is having the IT and, and that community um, involved. And and early too, from what we've seen, I mean, you, you need to get those folks involved right away in the conversations so that they don't come in at, at kind of an afterthought and then be like, okay, hold up, what's everybody doing here, right? Uh, and I'll do one last question here. This is from an anonymous person. Uh, how would you estimate your ROI as you suggest starting with a really simple use case? It's a great way to, to wrap it up. Really simple use case ROI. Yeah, I would say um, for the ROI one, we've we've dived, we've uh, you know dived into that quite a bit. Um, there's definitely uh, different perspectives. You can do a real light side, and if that works out well, it's enough to get started. Um, you can also launch an entire ROI campaign and take this no kidding very seriously, um, and that can also cost you. So, in terms of measuring ROI, you have to be careful that you don't get rid of all of your savings by trying to measure your savings. So. <laughs> There is a uh, there is a, a trade off to how hard you hit it, but I would also say leverage industry partners and and other enterprise uh, you know studies that have been done and start with that and use it more of a confirmation instead of trying to investigate it for the first time, because there are a lot of companies that have looked at this before and they're seeing similar use cases with similar value. So get yourself knowledgeable and then check. Yeah, like like Dan. And there's a lot of studies that have been published that are open open source forester studies. Uh, so don't try to reinvent the wheel and go do some research on your own. Uh, and uh, well said on you know don't don't do time studies uh, to death uh, where your ROI just goes in the trash can. I think finding your your largest challenges and tackling those first uh, will certainly easily yield the results results you're looking for from an ROI perspective. Great. Any final uh, thoughts, comments from anyone? All right. So, uh, guys, thank you so very much for uh, attending today. I can't tell you how much we at Scope AR appreciate that. We had a couple questions got asked about uh, the recording of this webinar. We're going to do our best to distribute that, obviously, given the sensitivity of, uh, of our uh, focus industry here. We want to make sure that we have everything uh, signed off and okay. Uh, for more information, you can always visit scopear.com or reach out to sales at scopear.com. Uh, and I've got a QR code if everyone wants to pull out their cell phones here. If you're not already a WorkLink user, you can download the app for free today and try out any one of the demo projects right on your desktop um, or countertop or, or whatever your flat surface may be. So definitely give that a try. AR is at your fingertips. And uh, once again, want to thank everyone for attending today. Fantastic discussion. Um, we got thumbs up from the entire Scope AR uh, employee base, which is just very, very happy to have everyone uh, on the call today. And I, I, once again, thank you guys so much. Um, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. We'll thank see you. everyone next time. And thanks so much.